All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining in tonight. Wherever you are, maybe it's the morning for you because it's the morning for Josh over there in Australia. So thank you for just being here, whatever time it may be. But I'm excited tonight because we have the author of uh, a new book that was just revealed today that's going to be coming out very soon in the Song of the Sleepers series. And I actually have already read a prequel into this series, which is right here. And I have trouble saying this one, the rest to the gods. Like I have to remember the rest because I think it's like a saying, right? Like leave the rest to the gods. But yeah. for whatever reason, it like tricks me up when I try to say that one. But <laughs> there it is. The rest to the gods right here by Josh Walker. And there oh, you have the same one. Ooh, <laughs> that looks good. So this just came out today. <laughs> so again, Josh, how are you doing this morning for you? Thank you so much for joining in, man. Really good, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So as you know, this is called The Book Brew. And uh, usually I drink a you know a couple beers, maybe three not, or four, not the entire can, just a little bit of a sample, because uh, we want to have a time where we can actually talk in a coherent manner. Yeah. But I mean, maybe someday in the future we can drink four straight <laughs> yeah. cans we can future, drink but... without coherency at some point <laughs> <laughs> but the first thing before we get into anything book related i just wanted to you know tackle this first with this being a rumor or not really a rumor you telling me that you actually make your own beer you're a brewmaster right hey yeah no i i, I have been brewing for about um oh nearly 10 years actually at this point um 10 years and yeah yeah it's been a while I, it's been a, a good journey actually like brewing is so good because it uses a scientific part of my brain that i most of the time can't engage with when i'm writing or reading because those outlets are so creative so brewing has been really good for me um and I, i'm a big beer nerd so it kind of it matches up with my personality a lot um but yeah brewed for competitions occasionally um, haven't taken out any crowns, but I've got a few second places and stuff <laughs> under my belt. And um, yeah, I love it. I'm really passionate about it. So, now you saying that it like opens up the scientific side of your mind. It, yeah. It's just kind of funny because right now I'm watching or rewatching a show called Breaking Bad. And, you know, there's a whole scientific process of making that <laughs> drug. So it's like, <laughs> for you, it's you know, it's it's alcohol, it's beer. So it's all good there. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Do you have like a whole? Gig, you have like a whole logo in terms of like you, when you bottle it or you can it. Like, how does that even work? For yeah, I've make got labels. Beer? I actually don't have one handy to show you, unfortunately. But I do have um, labels. I've got a canning machine. I've got a can with me, which I thought uh, we could pop open. Um, at some oh yeah. Point. But these are the cans that I use. They're just a big silver can. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, five hundred mil. Um, and yeah, I've got a big kind of nice label that goes on the front there. And um, and usually I'm brewing for, I mean, obviously for myself, but a lot of times I'll do friends' weddings or parties and stuff like that. Um, oh, it's so cool. It's one of those things where, like, when you're brewing, it's so hard to brew, like, small amounts of beer. <laughs> um, but then it's obviously really bad to just sit there and drink, like, 20 liters of beer <laughs> yourself. So I've had to find ways to kind of dispose of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so cool. Yeah, I, I want to check out a full on can of yours too, at some point to see what that logo looks like. Like, what do you call it? Do you have like a name for it or is it just like whatever you're brewing up that a certain batch, you name that particular batch? Yeah. So it's actually, I've got like a, a brewery name that I use when I go to competition and it's chapter book brew, uh, chapter book brewing. Yeah. So um, it's obviously brewing. inspired by my, uh, my other hobbies. And I usually try to name a beer after something that I've read, either a quote, or even like a title to a story oh, or, or anything like that. So that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> What's the last name of the last beer that you named? The last beer that I named, I'll pull up. What do I have here? Hold on. Um, was it's actually, it's not the last one, but it's one of the last ones was the obsidian path, which is named after the book by um, Michael R. Fletcher. Oh, Michael. R. Fletcher. Yeah. I think I've seen his covers yeah. all over the place. Isn't there yeah, yeah, one yeah. where he's like writing a big old cricket or a beetle or something? Oh like, yeah, the new book. Yeah, I think it's called okay. "The Storm Beneath the World." I think that's what it's called. It sounds so chaotic. But I'm really <laughs> <down for it. laughs> the cover looks chaotic. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
now that we're here, we're finally online. Let's get into one of these beers. I have four in front of me. I actually, I went to uh, my local gas station because uh, I was running out of beer. And the gas station that's right near me actually stocks up on a lot of like not typical like just Miller Lite or over here in the States, Bud Light. Like they have more. They have like IPAs. They have craft brewers as well. Nice. And I was like, okay, this is pretty nice. So, and I bought some cans. The only problem is like these cans are massive. And like for this, <laughs> what we're doing tonight, like I don't need a, a giant can, but that's all they sell. So their first one I have right here is called tropical beer hug as you can see there's a bear right there with some like pink sunglasses going on and it's an ipa and uh it's 9.9 percent alcohol <laughs> that is chunky that is uh that's a chewy beer and it's by this brewery right here if you can see it goose island I, i've uh, heard right. of them before yeah i haven't had this one though so we'll see how that one is but what do you got, man? That sounds great. Well, I thought maybe I should pull open one of mine first. The fun thing about this is I don't know what's in it <laughs> because I didn't <laughs> label it. So I'm just going to pop it open. And if it's something I don't want to drink, I'm not going to drink it. But but we'll, we'll we'll find out in a second. I'll tell you what it is regardless, and I'll show you what it looks like. I've got a few glasses here. So. Sounds good. Let's see. And can you tell by, by the color when like, you pour it out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have a look. Let's see what do we have here tonight. Oh, I think this might be. I think this might be a pilsner. Actually, can you see the color on that? Oh yeah, looks like a Sorry. Miller Lite type of color. Yeah, or... yeah. Like a, so yeah. it's based off of um a Czechoslovakian pilsner. Um, have you heard of uh, pilsner Urquell? I don't think so. There's another one actually, Budva, which is the original Budweiser. Oh, that's no the, way. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, that's the Czechoslovakian Pilsner. It's one of my favorite styles of beer. That's a, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, yeah me, and um, Budvar is... Uh, is Budvar. Really, yeah, you, you should try to find it if you can, man. It's it's really cool because it kind of gives you the full history of, uh, of Budweiser in, in one bottle, you know? Like, it's it's got a lot of that kind of character that you'd be used to drinking, but it's yeah. got a lot of, like, heavy hop character that, that isn't usually there um in in kind of um modern day budweiser yeah you call it budvar is mm -hmm. that you said it, was, it came from not america no it comes from czechoslovakia that's insane. i believe the history is that when it came to america um people couldn't brew it locally for whatever uh... reason i'm not sure if it was related to farming or or something else but yeah so they kind of changed the recipe slightly and and that kind of became the modern Budweiser, but you can still buy <laughs> Budvar. That's so cool. Because yeah. like yeah, yeah. the marketing behind Budweiser is just so like America. This is American yeah. beer right here. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't even try mine yet. Uh, what's it called again? Tropical beer hug. I'm gonna try it out. <laughs> I want to hear how this goes. Right off the bat, it tastes like an IPA. <laughs> yep. Like most IPAs though. taste the same to me. <laughs> it is pretty strong though. Yeah. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna Did keep going at hand? it. There's no way. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's way too much. You see how big that can is? Yeah. Oh my god. So Dude, actually, like, yeah. it's funny. I nearly grabbed another can from the fridge that was labeled, um, and that was the one that was named after Michael Fletcher's book, and that that's a chai spiced imperial stout. It was like 12 and a half percent alcohol. I was like, no way am I doing that at 11 o'clock in the morning. So, <laughs> sorry, I had to skip out on that one. <laughs> you, have a full, you have a full day after this. That's okay. it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, all right, after this, I'm probably going to hit the hay, go to bed. But yeah, you have some, some time left, some time left in the day. <laughs> so first thing that I want to talk about was probably a big highlight for you today in terms of the cover reveal for your new Ooh. book, book number one in the Song of the Sleepers series. And I wanted to pull it up, actually, just so we can see this on the screen in all its glory. So all I got to do is just click the right button. And uh, let's do this one first. There we go. 
Hey. So this stunner. thing is just a stunner, man. When I yeah. saw this, when he first sent it to me to help out in that cover reveal, I was like, whoo. Now this thing, <laughs> it just gives off so many vibes here in terms of, one, you have this crazy, huge tree that kind of reminds me of Avatar a little bit because it's just a one huge, massive tree that I know has a huge significance in the story itself. Yep. And then this guy is kind of like looming or just brooding there, just kind of staring at it. It's like, what? And then I just noticed this. There's this person right here. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> There's a person way down there as well. So, so many people picked up on the second dude um, <laughs> just today, and I thought it was so funny. That's awesome. It looks like he's holding a staff or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a walking stick. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And let me bring up. Uh, let me click another button here and bring up the full widescreen image. Because that yeah, one yeah. is also, I think that would work perfect for any like uh, desktop background. I bet, did you yeah. make it your background on your phone or something? I haven't done that yet, actually. Um, actually, what I want to do is get the text taken off. So I've asked Jeff to do that and he'll send it back at some point and then um, hopefully send it out to some newsletter subscribers or whatever. But yeah, how good is that? <laughs> Look at that thing. It's beautiful. Yeah, when I was making the thumbnail for this video, I was like, I can't reveal anything important, but it's still so beautiful, though. So I just grabbed, like, the left section over here, just these really yeah, nice yeah. Looking mountains over here, <laughs> and it looked great. He's so, done such a good job. Yeah, tell me, I know you, we were talking about this just before we entered the stream here, in mm -hmm. terms of when you're working with Jeff, right? You're working with, mm -hmm. uh, and he basically was sketching it out in front of you, in front of your very eyes, like over a Zoom call or something. It was amazing. Jeff, um, Jeff is really good at kind of visualizing things that that I'm only good at articulating with words. So um, we kind of had a back and forth conversation. And um, while we were talking about what kind of angle we could take, he was just literally just sketching stuff <laughs> just live in front of me. And I could just see it come to life. And basically the bones of that whole cover, including the typography, um were all there within 20 minutes of chatting to him and it was absolutely incredible i've still got those original draft files because i remember just just like screenshotting it while we we're on the call <laughs> and just like looking at it afterwards and like shaking with excitement like he's just he he's just a wizard like i've said it a hundred times but he's just amazing um and he's a really lovely guy to work with um yeah high aptitude for kind of understanding how to visualize what i was trying to you know, mm -hmm. give him, um, I'm just which is really difficult to do. Have you, are you familiar with the office at all? With yeah, uh, yeah. Michael Scott. I'm yeah. just picturing this one meme where he like walks out of his office and he's like, it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> in terms of you doing that when you're watching this guy. Oh, hundred percent. This in front of you. Yeah. 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 And yeah. also I think one of the other things like in, in his working process is, is having a conversation about what is actually a marketable image. So we kind of talked through a lot of key scenes in, in the story. Um, and we were trying to decide on one that would work. And this one works because I mean, one, it doesn't really give away too much. It gets you to ask questions, but it doesn't spoil anything for the story. Um, and two, it seemed like the best image to be able to stand back and, and see it from a distance or have a look at like a tiny thumbnail on Amazon, for example, and still see all the oh, yeah. details. Yeah. I mean, they see how I zoom out right here. You can still yeah, tell yeah. there's a big tree right here. Yeah. Which looks fantastic. And like the green against the that golden sun looks Yeah. Whew, it's chef's beautiful. kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this off. Here we go. No, that looks fantastic. I am so happy for you that we had this reveal today. And I know a part of that was the arc sign up process. Did you get a lot of people kind of like chomping at the bits trying to so, you know what? Hands up. I would love to read this. Yeah, I've, I've had a really good um, reception so far. So I think I've got about 30, which is really cool. And and 30. honestly, I just want to keep it going. Ooh. Like my goal was 20. And if I can if I can keep it going and get it into more people's hands, that that's key. You know, so anyone who wants to, to sign up and leave a review for me once they've read it, please mm -hmm. just use the form. Like, yeah, I'm all ears as well. Like anything that, that people want to ask me or whatever. Um, and another thing with the arc process as well. Um, I was actually talking to um, Zach um, ZSDMIT about um, yeah. 
how he ran his recent um, arc list for Stone, Stone and Tide, which is the second book in his Stone and Sky series. And um, he did something really cool where he had like a bit of a arc party at the end with a bunch of people. Um, all the arc readers jumped onto like a Google Hangout with him and just had a chat with him, you know, spoilers open um, about the book and what they thought of it. And I thought that is just such a cool way to engage and give back to everyone who's given my book a chance. So we're going to do something like that as well. So if you sign up to the Arculus and you read the book, you're welcome to join in for that. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that, that's amazing that you had 30 people already sign up for that thing. Because I know when I'm talking to any authors, or at least when I'm scanning through you know, Twitter or wherever, even like on Reddit, like in the self-published forums, there's a lot of people who are struggling with just getting people to acknowledge that their book is out there and ready to read and um, to have 30 people say, yeah, I am down for a Josh Walker for book number one. I don't even know what it's about, but I'm ready for it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm so amazing. appreciative. It's, um, it's hard to take a chance when there's so much good stuff coming out. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm really flattered. I know you're definitely aware of a lot of things good coming out because you're also the co-founder of the break-ins. And for anyone watching this, uh, I actually spoke to, the whole Brady bunch of the break-ins <laughs> a few weeks ago. It was like seven of them all releasing books in 2023, 2024, or very soon in upcoming. And uh, it was such a great time. I learned so much about um, the whole uh, process you guys went through, how the group started. I, I learned a ton. So that was a really fun call. But uh, going back to the point of what my little tangent was, is that you're aware of a lot of things coming out, yours included. So how how are you like balancing out the time right now in terms of writing your own material, your actual you know day job, and then uh, this whole break-ins group over here? Yeah, look, it's the worst and the best problem to have. <laughs> you know, like it's just like I have to be honest. Like everything I've read from people in the group is just like incredible. There's some stuff that I've read that hasn't been announced yet from other authors, but when it rolls out, I think people are going to be absolutely blown away. Um, but but it's all about finding the time, as you say. And um, teaching is pretty demanding. So um, I'm a primary teacher, and there is kind of a lot of paperwork on both ends of the working day, um, which is pretty standard. Um, but trying to kind of balance that, drafting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm drafting the next novella in the series at the moment. Plus, I'm also editing book one ahead of launch. Oh, yeah. um mm -hmm. and then obviously i've got to do formatting and blah 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 blah, proofreading etc um and then also trying to get in some reading <laughs> time is just crazy so i mean i've opted this year to pick a lot of audio books um so there's a lot of trad stuff i'm reading on audio because it's easy to access and i can listen to it you know on the car drive to work etc and then if i'm reading at home it's usually reading novellas or you know sections of whatever i can possibly fit in to kind of mm -hmm. support my friends just because um yeah time is uh <laughs> time is short <laughs> yeah i didn't even i didn't even mention out of those three books i was just talking about reading i didn't even talk about that yet like you're also yeah. reading books as well i think i remember now on your instagram like you were talking about you know what i've read in the past few weeks and i think it was in your newsletter too in terms of what you're reading mm -hmm. as well so also uh i think your newsletter looks fantastic i i received oh, it a few weeks ago and for everyone who's watching this when you sign up for the newsletter you also get a free e-copy of the prequel novella as well which was a very fun time by the way i have a full-on review on fanfiattic.com so if you are interested in learning more about the song of the sleepers got a review there also the book is free i mean come on all you gotta do is just sign up for a newsletter pretty That's easy it. <laughs> <laughs> no thank you i appreciate that uh, the april newsletter will come out tomorrow so that will have um the cover and the link to the arc list and a few bits and pieces on there too so but newsletters are just they're just such a cool way to engage with the community and like i i talk about this a lot but giving back like i love to be able to give back for everything that i've received um because i've been so lucky um and so i'll always include some links to other cool stories that are coming out mm -hmm. from different people and stuff like that as well which is really cool. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I know uh, you got a lot going on. And you're also brewing beer as well. Which brings <laughs> yeah. me to the next segment, 
which is uh, beer number two already somehow. I don't know how we're already 19 minutes into this. I really don't know how, how that happened. <laughs> but I, good. if I had to give a rating out of this, I mean, I know it's all subjective. I'm not the biggest IPA fan, so maybe I should have known that going into it. Uh, like a three out of ten. Ooh, I don't know. Ooh, I'm not a, a fan of that one. <laughs> that's a hard hit off. <laughs> and it's uh, luckily they weren't too expensive, right? Because they're single cans. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Is by Sweetwater oh, Hazy wow. IPA. So you know what's wrong? I got another IPA here, but maybe it tastes better. <laughs> that's Dude, I love whole. hazies. I absolutely love hazies. I don't know if I do. See, with you knowing all about beer, you know, like how to describe it. Like this, mm-hmm. this one has more hops. This one that has more, yeah, whatever. You know how to describe it. Versus me, I'm like, it's good, or <laughs> it's bad. Well, I can tell you what what should present in a decent hazy, and you can tell me if it adds up. Okay, let's see. So, a lot of times with hazies, there's a lot more protein that's kind of kept inside the the mash when when uh when the grains are mashed and so we use oats a lot in that process so it should be kind of soft on the mouthfeel um and then there should be like a pretty vibrant tropical fruit thing coming through on the aroma and and in the taste so it could it, it could sometimes remind you of like a breakfast juice um yeah this one actually and then it will better. usually have a bitterness at the end as well this one says a double dry hopped straight up juice bomb delicious that's a way to describe it's pretty good yeah it's one of my favorite styles <laughs> that's a good quote right here <laughs> Oops, <laughs> hey, the other the other two are not ipas okay bo so uh we'll get to those that are not ipas later <laughs> I, I i think I, i've heard of dogfish before uh, i think i was actually looking at a can earlier today but i got the sweet water instead What's your number two on your side, Josh? So my number two comes from an Aussie brewery that's right around the corner from my house. Um, I live down on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, and there's a great brewery here called Banks. And these guys are just the best in the game, in my opinion, at the moment. Um, I think I think I'm there every week, which is really bad. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually this is their Oktoberfest, so it's a lager. Oh, okay. Um, Really nice German lager, and um, I'll just give it a pour. I don't even see this. I, mean, I should do this. Uh, this is a good idea: is to uh, get glasses for the pours. You know what, oh, dude? I'm just a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but now it looks. It's like a whole presentation here. It looks good. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. actually. I, I'm a big uh, lager fan. That's probably my favorite. Uh, what do you call it? Variant of beer is yep. uh, lagers. But hey, did you by chance check out my my call with Tim Hawken, who is on who lives in Perth, in Australia? Yeah, I, I recall. Um, he works for is it Balta or one of one of the breweries? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know he Balta's was talking a about brewery. a few Australian beers over there. So I wonder if uh, the one that you have right now is actually one maybe he he mentioned or not i don't think it was but i do have another one for round three that comes from a brewery that he mentioned which is one of my favorites look at this <laughs> <laughs> bo's not wrong <laughs> but it's 11 o'clock hey don't blame me <laughs> yeah come on uh okay let me take one more sip of this sweet water i i don't mind this one too much i actually it's not my bad Compared to the the beer hug. Yum. Go on to this. The book mm-hmm. that I have read so far. One of the major elements that you can clearly see on the front cover is this mysterious looking orb thing. Yeah. Right. Which plays a huge part in the story. And uh, you're very early on presented to it when you're reading through the book. And uh, it also plays... Like the orb itself, it has like this music or this melody coming out of it, right? Yeah, it kind of um, it kind of hums. So it's when sad. I was reading yeah. this, I don't know for whatever reason, you might not even know what I'm talking about. I was thinking of the humming from Halo, the Halo theme song. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I don't know why, but I was like, when I was reading through this, like this nice melodic humming sound that you were just talking about, I was just like, hey, this is Halo. Yep. 
Dunno. Yeah, like a really yeah. deep drone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not too far off then in terms of this this not at all orb mysterious orb thing. That's actually Second a really point, cool way of describing it. <laughs> is uh yeah see now you can say that you have a little bit of halo yeah. inside of uh, your fantasy series. <laughs> I wanted to ask you in terms of the orb itself, and hopefully uh like you kind of learn about this very early on in the story, so hopefully it's not too much of a of a info dump for people watching this who have not read it. But the sleepers, these are these people who have abilities. They're able to use these orbs, right, in terms of like reaching into it. And are they like getting inside these orbs? Yeah, good question. So the the sleepers are basically these kind of like they're, they're treated like noble people, but effectively something funny has gone off between the tree that they live in and um and themselves and essentially when when this thing happens to them they get access to this orb right that kind of magically appears and um essentially they can go inside the orb and they can actually sleep and it's a capital Mm -hmm. s sleep yes um so it's different to just sleeping normally it's kind of like a meditative okay um I, i guess state where they're able to kind of absorb the power of the tree, the magical power of the tree that they live in, and then they can use that. And and it's tailored to be used for good. Um, but a lot of what drives the main conflict in this series is people trying to obviously exploit it for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. So when I was reading through this, and when our particular main character, you know, when she stepped into it or got into it, uh, have you watched any of the Fantastic Beast movies at all? The Harry Potter Fantastic Beast? That's really interesting. I, I have seen them. I haven't made that connection though. Because you know, Newt, the main character, yeah. has like this briefcase. Yeah. And it's, he has a full on zoo in this briefcase where he like steps inside of it and like he has all these this magical creatures inside of his briefcase. I was just picturing like something similar to that in terms of uh, Naisha. Yeah, go like stepping into the orb and you know doing her thing, and I thought it was just so. When I first read the sentence, I I had to highlight it. Uh, she needed to sleep, but first she needed to sleep with the capitalist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah. Like, I was like, wait, let me read that one more time. Oh, capital S. There's something significant <laughs> going on here. Yeah, that quote's caught caught a few people up, and I think what I wanted to draw attention to there was that this sleep that they go through is is not restful at all. Like, it actually saps a lot out of them. And so oftentimes when they come out of it, they're even more kind of haggard and, and wearied. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that obviously plays into, you know, I guess the rules behind this magic system. You can't overuse it or um, things will go wrong very quickly. No, I think that's great to have, like, limitations in, like, a fancy setting because sometimes when you're reading through a story and this character has a certain power or ability and then it's like, sp- like spam it, just constantly spam yeah. the power or whatever. It just feels like, I don't know, it wasn't earned or it's just, there's no challenge. Like you need a challenge, you need limitations in terms of, I guess, feeling more real. In this case, uh, I forget what the term is, but it was basically like a ball or a disc of power, right? What was that thing called again? Ah, the kism. Yes, this, yeah, I, kept, yeah. I think in my mind I said schism, but it's kism. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Like they're basically little... like a small version of the orb that the sleepers can sleep inside. Um, but but you can actually kind of uh, concentrate some of the power from the orb into it, and then use that as portable orb power, essentially. <laughs> I like how you describe that portable orb power. Yeah, portable orb power. Yeah. <laughs> and then going back to Sam's <laughs> orb. Or, yeah. or, or. <laughs> so something else that I saw a lot of people also talking about was that we have like a species in here called the nestlers, which basically look like, was it, uh, weasels, but yeah. they might be cute on the outside, but they have a ferocious side where they can basically take your head off in a few seconds if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, a lot of people were talking about how they, this species kind of reminded them of a series called Redwall. Are you familiar for the Redwall series at all? 
Yeah, so Redwall was um, one of my absolute favorite things to read as a kid. And something that I that I always wanted to do kind of my whole life was integrate anthropomorphic cute animals back into the <laughs> adult fantasy setting. Um, because, and, and look, some people have done this really well before me. Like um, one that I always remember is a novella actually called The Builders by Daniel Polanski. And it's kind of like a grimdark take on Redwall. It's really cool. Uh, I would one hundred percent recommend reading it. But um, but yeah, so again? it kind of came from there. It's called the Builders. The Builders, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the we, the 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 Nestlers, as they're called, came from there. There's actually two kind of sects of that race. So they have Nestlers who live in the trees, and then they have burrowers who live underground. And in the novella, we're mostly seeing Nestlers for a particular reason because um because they're 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 um i guess comfortable with being above ground but the mm -hmm. borrowers will appear in other parts of the story as well so that's exciting yeah uh, i know something else oh wait before i get to that we're mm -hmm. gonna see some more nestler action right in uh book oh, number yeah. one yeah a little bit a little bit in book number one but it'll 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 kick <laughs> off in uh, novella number two as well Oh, I think I, I read I read on your website that the novella number two is going to be more of a, a lighthearted, like, side story, right? Yeah, it was meant to be. I probably need to change that now. I started writing it, and it's pretty bleak, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's supposed to be a little bit dark, or it's supposed to be happy-go-lucky, a little bit brighter, and then you change <laughs> it. You know what? We're making us a bleak world over here. So one thing I've always tried to do with my books is I've tried to find a really cool comp title. Um, and, and with book one, the comp title for me was like Toy Story, but like mixed with like The Wheel of Time and like Murder Mystery. And everyone's like, what? Toy Story? Like, what's going on? <laughs> and then with, uh, with the novella, I didn't really have anything for the first novella, but for the second novella, I was thinking like Disney's Tarzan, but like mixed into this world. Now that I'm writing it, like that is still there, but it's it's pretty dark. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so, would Disney approve it to make make it a movie? Oh, I don't know. It'd be great. One day. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Noble bright humor. Yeah, no, Sam go. can do that. <laughs> That's great. So, um, where are we at? Thirty two minutes already. What the heck, man? Mm -hmm. What's funny is that. When we're when people were talking about the Redwall series, I uh, did not know what the Redwall series was. I never read it as a kid, so I had no idea. But maybe like five or four months ago, I did a mystery box on like unboxing, where in that box I pulled out a copy of Redwall. I forget which number it was, but it was like it was way up there, like number nine, number ten. And like I was pronouncing this author's last name so bad, I got, what was it Brian <laughs> Jacquees? Brian uh, Jacquees. I was saying it so bad. <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 a French last name, so so I always said in my head Jacques because that's how you'd say oh. it in France. But the thing is that apparently, apparently he just says Brian Jakes. Oh, Brian Jakes. That makes it so much easier. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> So I only learned that recently as well. You know, I had people commenting. It was like, I, I I paused the video and just exited out once I heard this man <laughs> say the last name incorrectly so bad. I was like, ah, I'm sorry, guys. It's easy to do. It's easy to do. <laughs> I find myself doing that very easily, especially with within the fantasy genre, because we just have some crazy names sometimes. Um, Absolutely. Just, I mean, it's not going to be just Jeff or yeah, even John. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, we got crazy names. <laughs> and to be fair, like I run under, I write under a pen name. My first name is Josh, um, but my last name is not Walker. And the and the reason for that is because if I made up my real last name, no one would be able to look me up. So it's just it's just marketing, right? Like you gotta you've got to make sure you've got a name that's easy to Google. <laughs> at the end yes. of the day. Now that's yeah. a good point. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Hmm. So is your last name like? Hard to pronounce. Yeah, hard to pronounce and hard to spell. Still starts with W. Okay. Well, I guess that works out. Um, well, now, 35 minutes in, how... Mm -hmm. Oh, you finished that one? Was it... That or was do you like score a, half of it? 
I was like a half ball. Yeah. Okay. There we go. My number three, I uh, I got something kind of cheap. I guess you could call it a cheap beer. It's a, a Natty Daddy. Ooh. Natty Daddy, which I think is just like natural light, but they branded it as a Natty Daddy. That's eight percent. I, yeah, it is eight percent. Holy cow! That's, yeah, that's super strong for a lager. Now, I have not tried it before. It was like a dollar fifty-eight, so it should be. Uh, <laughs> it should be an interesting beer, but I'm gonna try it out here. What's your third one? So my third one is from a brewery that I believe Tim mentioned on his book brew. Um, they are called Mountain Culture. He did and mention that from. Yeah, yeah. These guys, I think, are probably the best brewery in Australia right now. Like, I'm biased towards Banks because they're my local. But but these guys are just, oh, they're amazing. And um, Mountain Culture is super cool because they're from the Blue Mountains in Sydney, which is where I grew up. And um, the uh, the Sydney side is up there. I'm just so proud of it. Like, everyone's <laughs> just so proud of this brewery because they're just killing it. And, and they make absolutely fantastic beers. But the thing about this beer is this is a, a lager. It's an Aussie lager. Okay. And the thing I love about this is they launched it. Um, so the launch that they did for it on social media was a real launch via rocket. By a rocket. So if you want to see this beer get launched on a rocket, you can go to their Instagram page and see that there. It's super <laughs> cool. Mountain culture. <laughs> They're act- acting like Elon Musk over here launching a Tesla into space. That's we got, it. We got That's a beer it. instead. I mean, honestly, I'd take the beer option any day. So, so that's what it looks like. It's very kind of pale mm. yellow, super clear. This is actually a mountain culture lager glass as well. Oh, well, so. look at you, man! It's like you're yeah, representing I'm over here. Fan. You're a salesperson. Yeah. <laughs> <Big> <laughs> fan. Do they have like a like a tasting room that you go to for mountain culture? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, that they, they have two. Uh, one of them is about fifteen minutes down the mountain from where my family lives. And then the other one is 15 minutes up the mountain from where my family lives. So um, they've got a massive tap room where they distribute from. It's a big warehouse. And then they have this beautiful kind of boutique tap room up nestled in the mountains, up a bit higher. Um, just a beautiful old heritage building that they've kind of done up. And yeah, they're just incredible. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I love tasting rooms. Because um, you're right there where they're making it. So yeah. you know, you're getting it nice and fresh. I mean... Oh, however it's brewed and uh there's one that's right right next to me uh and just the city over and they actually distribute all over florida now which is awesome but they're right here in like my hometown and they also uh maybe not, not the right words probably not brew but they make wine however you say oh, okay. making wine like brewing beer well um, that's the thing they kind of just call it wine making wine, which okay. is really funny yeah <laughs> So they do winemaking and brewing, and they're both phenomenal. Like they have a, like a blueberry beer, which oh, yum. is so good. But they also have a blueberry wine. It's like the most popular seller here um, in my my part of the the states over here in Florida. That so sounds delicious. So, good. so the Natty Daddy, by the way, is actually yeah. pretty good at eight percent. It's probably dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Natty Dad, wow! I didn't expect that. It's like a, a nice, chill lager for a dollar, like a dollar fifty. <laughs> that's awesome. A dollar fifty, man. Beer is so expensive in Australia these days. Let me tell you. And how much is like a pint? Uh, a pint. It depends on where you go, but a pint will send you back between ten and fifteen bucks Australian, which is pretty expensive. Um. So I think that'd be about, what's that? Yeah, probably eight bucks, nine bucks in America. So I'm not sure that's if that's pretty, similar that's to what you up pay there. for. Yeah, it's but pretty there, expensive. There are some beers that are $10 plus in my, on my side. And uh, I'm like, is it worth it? I mean, it tastes amazing, so maybe it is. So. Yeah. Yeah, there is a bit of that. I think the other thing in, um, in, in the Australian industry anyway is... Um, excise tax so every brewery pays like an excise tax depending on how much alcohol is in the beer depending on how much they're distributing etc and then that obviously gets lumped on top of the 
of the sale price to the public. So there's kind of a lot of variables at play, but but it is a bit of a shame because it's harder to get access to to beer at a, at a more regular price in our country. Um, but the good thing is that everyone's really like keen and eager to support local breweries and we've got so mm-hmm. many good ones. Um, so that's really cool. Like mountain culture. So if I ever exactly. go to Australia, I got to try them out. Dude, you have to. They're fantastic. <laughs> I'll take you there. <laughs> I'll take you there. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you know next time I'm heading over to... Uh, uh, yeah, it's a big trip. <laughs> it's a, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, in terms of uh, the rest to the gods, I know there's like alternate... What do you call it? Alternating timelines in terms of our main character's um, story, in terms of like the present now, and then you have the past. Cool. Do you have like a similar structure in book number one in terms of it being told in like alternating timelines or is it just told in a linear fashion with multiple POVs or is he, is there a single POV? Like I, I have no idea. Yeah, okay. So, so there's a bit of background to this. Basically book one is very typical um, multi POV all in the same timeline. So chapter by chapter, you'll be essentially in a different character's point of view. And, um, and it's all set at the same kind of concurrent time. With the novellas, like the alternating timeline thing popped up completely by accident. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Initially, like I actually finished the draft for Exile back in around July, August last year. And then I did a first pass on it and sent it to some of my first beta readers who are two of my best friends. And um, while they were reading it, I just needed to do something to pass the time. Yeah. And so I wrote Nisha's story completely off the cuff, pants it, barely any plan. Um, and the alternating timeline thing wasn't how it was for the first kind of four chapters. But then I quickly realized, oh, no, I need more context here. So mm-hmm. I started putting flashbacks in and they didn't work unless they were their own chapter. And so then I thought, well, if I can get the conflicts of both timelines to actually line up, so the climax is nearly twice as powerful, then I've I've kicked the goal, right? So so that's kind of what it turned into. And with all of the other novellas now, um, I'm looking at that the same way because every novella is going to focus on an origin story for a different side character in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now I'm really trying to focus on getting those climaxes to, to build up and have both timelines kind of come to a head at the same moment. That's great because uh, I know... Like the um, which one came first? Was it the the now in this book, or was it the past for you? I think you said that you're writing the the current uh, now in yeah, terms of correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I love yeah, the, the, the the past yeah. in uh, yeah. <laughs> this series because it gave fantastic context, like you were saying, in terms of her you know, family upbringing and just being, you know. What happened in the story, which I'm not going to spoil for anyone who hasn't read it just yet, but fantastic um, kind of development for that character. And it's crazy to think that this is just a side character because um, I wonder at what point we're going to meet her in book number one. But yeah, I mean, Nisha's still a she's still a point of view character for some parts of the novel. Okay, but she's definitely in more of a mentor role. So you'll see her through another character's point of view most of the time that you see her. Um, but I think the thing about Nisha as a character, and I've said this before, is that she's really similar. Like she's she's really similar to me. I mean, every character kind of takes a little bit of you, right? But Nisha's really similar to me in so many ways. And I needed that that then timeline. Like I needed to write that context nearly for myself. Um, so so the novella is quite personal to me. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, semi memoir or anything like that, but. Um, but but there's a lot of her in me, right? And and um, and and so that's kind of like why it's structured that way. But yeah, she'll she'll be in book one and she'll be in it quite a bit. But she probably won't own much of the point of view. Yeah. Okay. Mm. No, I I'm happy that she's uh, making a reappearance. Absolutely, but I think yeah, she's uh, a badass. <laughs> yes, I think that's a consensus for a lot of people is that she's just a uh, intimidating. Uh, creature person to to deal with um going for the main character 
when you were first posting about it, maybe a day or two ago, like, what does it mean to drift or it was something similar to that? Like, mm-hmm. I was like, what's he talking about? Like drifting, like in, um, uh, um, fast and furious, Tokyo drift. Or... <laughs> I wish, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the main character's name, right? It, it's drift. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Okay, yeah, cool. But there's kind of a second layer of magic in this world, which I won't go into for spoiler reasons, but mm-hmm. um, it's got to do with the importance of names and what names do to people. And that and that was kind of semi-inspired by some of my greatest kind of writing influences, including The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, which is um which has a very strong focus on the importance of names in everything, right? Not just people, objects, mm-hmm. the way that we kind of see the world and react to it and contextualize it as human beings, we need names for everything, right? And so Drift's story um, is kind of linked to this secondary part of the magic system that's 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 happening inside the Great Tree, um, which is related to naming children um, when they're born um, without consent. And so it kind of, it, it plays out throughout the series uh, in the background, but um, you'll see it come to a head towards the end of the series for sure. Naming kids without consent. That's kind of what we do today, right? We just yeah. give people names. <laughs> but the difference is your parents would be doing it. Your parents will be doing it. Naming... Your parents would name you, right? Like the nurse would not name you. Yeah. Okay. So, so the ner- Yeah. So, so I oh. think the thing is here is that someone else is naming these children for a significant okay. purpose got it, and, got it. and that right has been kind of taken away um, from the parents. That's very interesting. Wow. That, that's a very cool concept. Actually, I have not read the name of the wind. I have it on my shelf. I've not read it just yet though. Oh, you I have mean, to read it. I heard, it's it's beautiful. Be- I, I have heard amazing things about it. Like the prose is beautiful. It reads like poetry and that uh, it's just a fantastic story. I know that he's in a little bit of hot water right now in terms of Rafa's, uh, I forget the reason why, because I haven't read the book, so I, I don't know just yet. But um, in terms yeah, of like, a few reasons, but I think like the actual core book, like just looking in and of itself, yeah, remains to me to be just one of the most fantastic kind of examples of um, contemporary yeah fantasy. It's just incredible, absolutely incredible. Now I, I like how you said that because I know Dan Simmons wrote Hyperion, and Hyperion mm-hmm. is one of my favorite books of all time, and a lot of people were not or are not happy with Dan Simmons, the author, but like you were saying, the book in itself, it's a story. It's an experience to me. I, uh, I had a fantastic time reading it. So I like how you describe that in terms of, uh, I, I think that's all that matters, right? Like, I mean, the same thing, I mean, in my perspective anyway, kind of happened with June, like the June sequels are okay. I still think the first one holds up as one of the greatest kind of science fiction books ever written. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, yeah. like the book can exist in and of itself and, and, and be just as special as it was when it first came out. Um, I think we've got a tendency in our modern society to over-criticize people because they're not like holding up, but it's pretty hard to hold up when the expectations are set that high from the get go. And, and like, honestly, that's, that's a compliment to, to Pat Rothfuss, right? Like yeah. the name of the wind is so astounding for a first book, honestly, like, <laughs> I don't blame him at all for the situation he's in now with book three. I wonder what uh how George R. R. Martin feels about that too. Expectations <laughs> are pretty pretty high <laughs> for this. See, next the thing book. about George Martin that's interesting is I've never read Game of Thrones. Wow, that's and I've never seen the show. So you I'm, seen the show I'm either. Kind of yeah, I'm lost. Like people will talk about Game of Thrones, I kind of know the character names, but I don't know much else besides Sean Bean getting beheaded in the first episode. <laughs> <kind of> thing. <laughs> spoiler, everybody, for season one. Okay. <laughs> spoiler for the first five minutes of season one. That's hilarious. I'm surprised you haven't watched uh, Game of Thrones with it being a huge you know, fantasy influencer. Um, yeah, I, I just never had time. Like, I, I, I read The Wheel of Time. That was kind of my my baby, so to speak, like my reading baby when I was a kid, like I just loved The Wheel of Time and mm-hmm. um, and, and absolutely devoured that series. And I've read it like several times over all the way through. And I love The Lord of the Rings as well. And I think just because 
those two things are so big and so dense and you have to take time to take them in. Yeah. I just never really had time to put aside for Game of Thrones. And by the time I did have that, I was kind of like, oh, there's so much other stuff now, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, so I've just always missed it, you know? I'm like on the opposite side because I never started The Wheel of Time um, until recently where I've read the first two so far. Nice. And I'm enjoying them. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, Game of Thrones had a special place because I don't know why. It could be because it was just the hype around this. This show was so dang huge. Like we had viewing parties with all my buddies coming over where we're just all in anticipation of what's going to happen. Cause I didn't read the books at this point. Like I've read the books now. Uh, but at that point we're all just on the edge of our seats, you know, what is going to happen. So um, I need to get back into wheel of time, but going to that, actually, how did you feel about the TV show for wheel of time? So I've seen season one, um, and for the most part, I enjoyed it. If I remove it from, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great comment. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I enjoyed season one in and of itself. I, I, I don't think it can really be put on the same level as the book. Um, mm-hmm. but that's a very biased perspective that I'm taking and I have, you know, no shame associated with saying that. Um, season two, I haven't seen yet, but I, I do want to watch it at some point. The thing about being an author now is that I would rather read. <laughs> like, you know, if I've got the choice of what to do with my free time, I would rather read because before I was writing all the time, I would be filling in those gaps with reading. So now it's like I'm writing so much, trying to do work, trying to do all this stuff. And then it's like, well, what do I do? Do I sit down and watch TV or do I read a book? I'm always going to pick the book. You know what I mean? So I just yeah. haven't seen like much TV at all um, in recent history. I mean, you already have what four buckets we already talked about reading, writing, break ins, your actual day job. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah there's a lot going on. So yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah. I know we have, uh, we're at the tail end of this. So I wanted to get to the number four beer that we have. And this nice. one is going to make a reappearance because I am uh, finally at the end of this six pack that I bought like. Okay. Three months ago, <laughs> with that being this Terrapin Lua. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, seen it has a cool a can. It's, it's a really, a cool really can. good can. Yeah. Is that brewed in Hawaii? Okay, let's see. Uh, does it tell you somewhere? It might say on the back. I just wonder it's... because it's called Luau. Yeah. Oh. No, it's in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, nowhere, that's cool. It's a cool influence. Nowhere near uh, Hawaii at all. But <laughs> I remember liking it. It's been a while since I've tried it. So let's see what we got here. Nice. Oh, yeah. That is very tropical. Passion fruit, orange, and guava. Oh, delicious. That good. sounds great. That sounds What's really your good. last one that you have? So my last one is potentially controversial. I'm kind of leaving you in the dust a little a bit. A controversial one, beer. This is Guinness. Now, hold on. Guinness is is not controversial in and of itself. Guinness is one of my favorite beers okay. of all time. Okay. But this is this is Guinness zero percent alcohol. <laughs> and I, I, I so kid weird. you not, it is fantastic. It tastes night and day like the real thing. So it's Guinness. But no yeah. alcohol. It's I mean, but no alcohol. It is like eleven o'clock for you or twelve o'clock for you. So you know, we'll we'll let it pass. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figure this will kind of help me get through the other <laughs> ones over the course of the day while I'm working. So, uh, but there you go. Look, it still has the same kind of cascadey effect. No, it looks like a Guinness. Yeah, yeah. they did a good job. Absolutely delicious. So this just came out to Australia. I know that in Ireland you can actually get it like on draft, like at the pub. Um, which is so cool. I think like, like from my perspective, especially as a, as a home brewer, beer is the kind of thing that is just so easy to consume. And it's also not great to just be drinking it all the time. So I balance it out a lot with non-alcoholic beer because I'm still kind of passionate about beer and I love the taste of it. Yeah. Um, but I would love to see more bars and stuff embrace this side of beer culture because I think there's some really cool non-alcoholic options that are popping up these days. 
No, I know Heineken. Yeah, yeah, Bo's right. Milk. Chocolate milk. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like a chocolate milk. Yeah. You ever try what do they call it? An Irish car bomb, where it's like a. Uh, oh yeah, you drop Bailey's the um, Irish cream. You drop yeah, it and then you do the Guinness. The Guinness. Right? Mm -hmm. So I've tried it once, and I'll never do it again. I like both of those things <laughs> separately. But dude, that that thing curdles something something. Yes, it does. Goes in. Not a good Ooh. idea. <laughs> So again, yeah, sorry. Cheers to chocolate milk. Chalky milk, as we call it in Australia. So I know we talked about Red Wall, um, uh, Name of the Wind are a couple that helped kind of inspire you. Are there any more books in real time? Any more books besides those three kind of guide you into a position that you are today in terms of writing your own you know, epic? Mm -hmm fantasy series like what, what are some of those books besides those three there are a lot but I'll, I'll give you the brief summary um two really massive fantasy series for me that got me i guess firstly back into reading a lot and secondly back into writing a lot um after university where i kind of had a bit of a, a drop in in my interest there um was the painted man by peter v brett which i think in the u.s is called the warded man um the warded man yeah the warded man is part of the demon cycle series and the whole series like as a whole kind of runs off at the end but the first kind of three books in particular are absolutely fantastic um so good and then another series that nobody talks about and i don't know why is um a series called the what is it called the first book is called 12 kings in sharakai by an author from Canada named Bradley P. Bolu, I think is how you say his name. I could be butchering that. Um, and 12 Kings in Sherikai is one of my favorite epic fantasies of all time. It is absolutely astounding. I love it to death. Wow. Um, I never heard of that one. 12 Kings in Sherikai. Yeah, yeah. And once again, in the UK, I think it's called Just 12 Kings. Um, oh. I think, oh, the series is called Song of the Shattered Sands. That's what it's called. Song? Oh, Song of the Song. Sleepers yeah. over here. <laughs> that was go. subconscious, I promise. But that <laughs> series was just absolutely fantastic. Um, and then I've got a few kind of random... I um, actually have some sitting here because I was looking at them recently. But I've got some some other non-fantasy books that really just inspire me as a writer. Mm -hmm. So, and, and actually, funnily enough, they all kind of relate to trees as well. <laughs> which again is not conscious but this first one's called um a tree grows in brooklyn by betty smith um so she's a writer from brooklyn this came out quite a while ago let me have a look yeah 1943 so it's an older book um it's it, it yeah it, it made me ball my eyes out it's made me ball my eyes out every time i've reread it it is absolutely fantastic um i want to say much more about that then this one here is another book that nobody talks about, but when it came out, it seemed to make a really big dent in the fantasy scene. It's called Some Kind of Fairy Tale by an author named Graham Joyce. Hmm. And it's it's just an absolutely beautiful book. His prose reminds me a lot of Patrick Rothfuss, but it's a little bit more ethereal. And it's mm -hmm. a cool book because it's kind of like a modern portal fantasy. So it's set half in the real world, but it's also set in the world of the Fae, which is super cool. Um, and then the other one, which actually did directly influence a lot of how I wrote The Great Tree, is this one here. It's called The Overstory by Richard Powers. And this is kind of like a literary fiction book with like hints of fantasy in it. And essentially, it's the story of many separate main characters that all find themselves um, connected via the network of trees in our real world. And how we're slowly destroying that through wow. climate change. Yeah. Well, also, all these really, books really cool book. that you've just talked yeah. about, I haven't read a single one. There you That's go. The that all these books had such a huge, you know, impact to you, and I haven't even read them just yet. So that's amazing that there's just so many books out there, man. That it's it's so many. Almost, it's sad to think that there's just so many amazing books. That, that you won't get to in your lifetime. Yeah. Yes, it's it's a very sad thought, but uh, all those sound fantastic. I like how a lot of them deal with songs or trees, 
and your book has a huge tree on it as well. <laughs> and then yeah. also uh, your co-founder, uh, Scott, also has song tied to tied kind of tied to his series as well in terms of being the like the last ballad right in terms the of first his... verse of the last ballad yes <laughs> like, how cool is that like <laughs> it's so cool yeah see if your book doesn't refer to a song is it fantasy nah <laughs> same with trees same with uh, actually Caden Caden calls it sad gardens if you don't have a sad garden in your fantasy story it's not fantasy <laughs> <laughs> so um when i was talking to uh michael r miller which you might be familiar with him with his uh songs of chaos songs oh my gosh songs of chaos series um one of his biggest points to me in terms of an indie author uh, at least helping him succeed was an audiobook and having these audiobooks in a position that were easily accessible and almost like in a like a box set. He kept reference, referencing a box set. Getting to the point of my question, at some point in the future, are you looking to do an audio version of either you know, The Rest of the Gods or your first book in the series? Yes, um, but there's a caveat. Um, there's a few challenges. The biggest challenge to me... Well, there's, there's two main challenges at the moment. The first one is I just don't have the income for it if I want to keep putting books out. It's just so expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but but the other challenge that makes it quite difficult as an Australian is there just aren't many outlets to actually get it done. So like I know in the US and in the UK and in Canada, um, you can use ACX, which is um, mm -hmm. Audible and Amazon's kind of um, side hustle where they help you basically find a narrator and distribute, et cetera, and then take a card. But we don't have ACX in Australia, um, which sucks. Mm. It, it's been asked for a lot, but um, nothing's happened with that. Um, I know that Spotify have something, I think it's called Find A Way or something like that, but I haven't really looked into it much. And then the other big player in that area is Podium. But the thing with Podium is you've got to have a pretty damn good kind of sales record um for them to be able to take the book and do something with it so i'd like to do something like if i could get in with someone like podium for example mm -hmm. i'd be all in very happy to do it but doing it on my own dime is really tough um way tougher than it should be actually like it should be really easy to do this um and it's not which is a really big shame because mm. something else that i really value is being able to give the book to anyone in any capacity so yeah. that the level of accessibility um, matches up with that. So, you know, readers who, who listen to audio because they can't read well or whatever, that's really important to me, but, um, but I just can't make it happen at the moment. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Like, you know, hopefully if these books do well, mm -hmm. then in the next few years, maybe I can kind of revisit the idea, um, take a bit of additional income that I've made and then put it back into to getting the first few books done as audio. That's, that's exciting. Yeah, I didn't even think about the barrier there in terms of ACX being offered in the U.S. compared to Australia. So that's that's huge. That's like that's a, a huge, huge barrier there that I didn't even realize was there. So, um, and considering there's a lot of kind of Aussie and um, New Zealand up and coming authors, I think yeah, hopefully mm -hmm. they make that change soon. But I think it's very limiting at the moment now like you're saying that it's a whole you know market of people like even for yourself you know you're kind of focusing on audio at the moment being an author a reader exactly uh working your day job so yeah that when it does happen which i'm sure these books are going to take off because book number 0 0.5 was fantastic i i'm going to be very excited to listen through it because uh, there's just some audiobooks that just kind of just stick with you because that narrator just brings it to life. So I'm sure when you do get to that point and you, you're kind of just vetting through, you know, voices and narrators, like who's going to be the best fit? You know, I bet that'll be super exciting. Uh, yeah, that'll be very exciting. I'm sure it'll happen one day. I just can't make any promises yet. Mm -hmm. No, I get you, man. I'm all here for, 
here for it though for when it does come out and i know we're getting to the tail end of this but now that we have a few more people on i wanted to show or showcase this amazing looking cover one more time yes so we can see this thing in all its glory share there we go <laughs> it's so good look at that thing now that is a cover. That is a desktop wallpaper that looks perfect for an ultra wide screen, by the way. Like how Which long I do it have. Is. I should throw it on there. <laughs> it would look fantastic. And uh, <laughs> I think Sam knows exactly who uh, did this cover. <laughs> yeah. Such a tease, Sam. <laughs> everyone knows, everyone knows Jeff did your cover too. No, I was actually saying to Aaron, at the start of the, the call, that Sam's cover was one of the ones that um, made me ultimately decide on on working with Jeff. Um, but but a lot of his covers just fantastic. Like the, the one that he's done for the Silver Blood Promise is just so epic. Um, and he's actually done some additional artwork for the Broken Binding edition as well, which is posted online too. So you should definitely check that out as well. Yeah, Broken Binding. They, they work with some amazing illustrators and artists. Uh, like... Almost every book they push out was just a stunner. It looks amazing. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm just rack racking up a collection right now of Broken Binding, and uh, I'm not complaining. It looks fantastic. So, Mister Josh Walker, um, I know we're getting to the tail end of this. We've drank close to four beers, not entirely though. All just samples, <laughs> right? Because you have the rest of the day. For you and your side and you had that zero percent um guinness which is mm -hmm. a very cool idea right i'm actually seeing uh kind of not outside of like drinks but outside of beer energy drinks are now giving away or distributing uh zero caffeine versions of their drinks of their energy drinks you know like prime that's energy bizarre <laughs> yeah. or um uh, yeah, like they ghost, sell like the hydration ghost one, right? Energy, like they mm -hmm. have ghost zero caffeine versions now. So we're just going to like this zero type of mindset in terms of everything. <laughs> I think the I thing know. with an energy drink is that it doesn't make much sense because you're buying it for the energy. Yeah. <laughs> but with a beer, like I mean, I mean, some people will argue the same with beer, but the difference is that yeah, see? a non-alcoholic beer is still brewed typically. So still going through that same kind of creation process um i don't know i i, I yeah i love not out beers personally but yeah yeah i don't think i've tried one just yet but i think i need to at some point you guys have a great um non out brewery in america called athletic athletic i think i've heard of them yeah That's yeah fun. they make some cracker beers actually i need to check that out again the main thing is just don't drink any of like the mainstream not out like don't drink like Budweiser Zero or anything like that because <laughs> they're, they're terrible. <laughs> See, caffeine free energy drinks are delicious. They got a good taste to them. Wow. So, um, I guess before we go, out of the four you know, beers that you did drink to dine, which one was your favorite? Um, well, it has to be the Josh Walker beer, right? No, no. Um, look, it's a hard call. It'd definitely be between these two. Um, so the Mountain Culture one or the Banks one. I love both these beers so much. But I'd probably say, for my current mood, I'd probably say the Mountain Culture one. But if you ask me tomorrow, I might say something <laughs> different. <laughs> and somehow, surprisingly, for me, out of all these huge cans that I have here, and the crazy looking bears on it. I think I gotta like the natty daddy the most here. I don't know why. Natty daddy. Nothing Natural like a good lager. <laughs> I think it's my favorite one. That's so good. There we go. So <laughs> I think we're come to a point now, man. I wanted to give you the floor now. If you had anything that you wanted to leave off with for whoever's watching up until this point or watching the replay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know I kind of put you on the spot a little bit in terms of, you know, tell me something. <laughs> but All anything right, you want to talk about. 
I'll tell you two main things. The first thing is hard covers for the novella just came out. They're really sweet. Uh, you can get them at Barnes & Noble. Um, they should be hitting Amazon soon and a few other places. And the second thing is drink good beer, read good books, and sign up for my arc list. Sign up for the arc list, everybody. We need... Also, sign up for his newsletter because you get a free copy of his novella as well. And you have a fantastic website, by the way. It looks Thank you. Uh, very beautiful. And uh, you get a lot of information on there as well. So I appreciate that. All right, guys. Before we go, one more thing. Uh, again, I have a review on this on fanfiaddict.com. So if you want to go check out the review, it's available right now. And the second book, actually the first book in the series, An Exile of Water and Gold, was just revealed today. The cover was just revealed today. So go check that out on Josh's profiles, Instagram, um, Twitter, slash X, and his website as well. You'll be able to see that amazing, stunning cover. And I think you said if you sign up for the newsletter, you're going to send like the high-res image as well. So Yeah, at some point I'll send it without the text on top. So well, I don't know that'd be great, be, but I'll do that at some point. So go sign up for all of those. Follow Josh right away because we have some amazing things in the future in store for this amazing up and coming epic fantasy author, Mr. Josh Walker. So thank you again so much for joining tonight, sir. I had a blast and uh, I'm, I'm happy that I'm not too, uh, I'm not too gone after drinking all of these four <laughs> samples. I mean, it's bedtime for me now, though, so you get the rest of the day. You'll sleep easy. You'll sleep easy. <laughs> I'm going to go mow the lawn or something. <laughs> go mow the lawn. <laughs> it's it's spring break. There we yeah, go. Yeah, that's it. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Have a good one. Keep reading, and peace.